He's, you know, one of Ireland's great fullbacks and one of Ireland's great players. And, you know, I think the most decorated, I think he tells the lads in, in <laughs> Leinster the whole time, he's the most decorated Irish rugby player of all time. But the reality is he is. It's the week of the 2020 Guinness Six Nations Championship and we caught up with former Irish captain Brian O'Driscoll as he launched a host of Guinness Six Nations cultural experiences. Brian, let's get straight into it. Uh, this is the 20th year of the Six Nations and of course that was your first year coming in in 2000. Um, very different Ireland squad. It was maybe a mix of the kind of old amateurs and then young lads like yourself coming through. Can you tell us a little bit what, what that dynamic was like? Uh, yeah, I think, I, first of all, I think there's always so much excitement around the, the Guinness Six Nations when it launches. I, I think we're the, it's the envy of, of the world mm -hmm. uh, from, a, from an international competition, an annual competition. And it's, um, you know, it's such a tough competition to win. And I yeah. go back to you know, when I came in initially in, in 99 and then properly in 2000, Ireland wasn't in a great spot. Um, we had had a really disappointing 1990s mm. um, and it was the beginning of, of that new crop of players coming through and, and I think it's just about marrying the old with the new. You have to hold on to a certain amount of experience but then bring through that new blood um, to be able to play with the freedom that only young people can. So mm. I think that's what Andy Farrell is looking at in, in this um, six, um, six Nations and um, and I'm sure he'll get that, that you know, combination right. Yeah, you talked before about Leinster pre-Michael Checa of getting changed in the back of cars and the boot of cars. And, and was there any kind of, a, was there that kind of element to, to Irish international rugby back then, which maybe seems so alien now? Uh, yeah, when well, you look at the quality of the training pitches that we would have trained on, um, you know, out in Nace, even though they were giving us their, you know, their their first pitch you know in the depths of winter it would have been badly cut up and you would have been moving around at different times trying to find the best track within close proximity of the hotel where that's all changed now you look at the the quality of the training pitches be it in carton house or the new training facility um you know the in, you know indoor full you know full pitch where mm. it doesn't matter what weather there is outside those sort of things definitely enhance your performance and give you an opportunity to prepare a little bit better so yeah, the game has come an awful long way in 20 years' time. Um, well, it was only, you know, only turned professional in 96. Mm. Um, so it's still relatively much in its infancy, but yeah. the progression has been phenomenal. And now I think we're a, a very professional outfit here in Ireland. Mm. Your first Six Nations in 2000, you scored tries against Scotland and Italy. But I think what every Irish fan remembers is that hat-trick against France. Is that something that must stand out for you when you think about it? Is there one of those three tries that maybe stands out to you in particular? Um, I think the third try is maybe the one that stands out because it was the important one that got us back in the lead. Um, the others were just keeping us in the, in the hunt, but then you know, the third one, I, I suppose didn't pay much heed to the fact that it was a, it was a hat trick. I, I just knew that we were back in the game and it's not somewhere where Ireland had, had really been in the game on 60, 70 minutes for yeah. the previous 25 odd years, <laughs> we were usually blown away and, um, and um, co finished comfortably second in a two horse race where all of a sudden we were in the mix and we had a chance of doing something that we'd really struggled to do for a long time. So yeah, I think the, the seriousness of the occasion probably hit me on that third one. Yeah. The cycling forward a few years to 2009, I think it's, not only a great Irish moment in the Six Nations, but just a great Six Nations moment was Ronan O'Gara's drop goal. What are your memories of that? Like being on the pitch, like you're looking up at the clock, obviously, and there was a, a Wales penalty to come and everything else. But when that went over, was there a beginning of like, okay, we're going to do this? Or was there like, right, we've only got three minutes on the clock now to see it out? Um, when it went over, I think we thought, yeah, the, well, geez, we're, we're, you know, we just have to be able to see it out now. And, and all you can think about is that next moment is trying to regather the kickoff. There's every likelihood that they're going to go short and try and regain the ball back themselves rather than kick deep. So you know the things that are likely to come at you and then to be able to deal with that pressure situation. It's miles easier playing than it is watching in, in those uh, environments um, and then when they did get the ball back it was just about trusting our defensive system and trying to talk to one another about not giving away a penalty mm. and alas we did and then I thought you know God, what what a kick in the teeth that is and mm. um, we'll still win the championship on points difference but it'll feel like a hollow victory um, 
because we want that elusive Grand Slam and thankfully the kick went a metre short. Miles easier playing than watching, that's really interesting. So is it just the fact that you're in the zone or is it that maybe as a, as a spectator you, you get to see so much more of what's well, you, happening? You, you can't, have, it can't have any effect on the game as a spectator, whereas um, as a player you, know, you have ownership of what happens. And yes, it's a team sport, but you know, you're a link in that chain to be able to get, the, get that job done. And, be it, you know, you can make a tackle or you can have a, an impact in, in attack that could be the difference between winning and losing a game. And, and having that control is something that I've missed as, as a, uh, you know, as an injured player or, you know, less so as a, as a retired player, but certainly when, you know, in your, throughout your prof professional career, when you haven't been able to play a game for one reason or another, mm -hmm. it's a tough place to, to, to be and the stresses are, far more accentuated in the stands than they are out on the pitch, for sure. One man who has to, I suppose, get used to that for the first time in a long time is Rob Kearney. He hasn't made the Irish squad for the first time in a long, long time. You shared a lot of big days uh, in green and in blue with him. Um, he kind of, I suppose, after such a decorated international career, mainly have played his last game in an Irish jersey without any kind of fanfare. Yeah, and... I think if you look at the common denominator for all of Ireland's success in the last 10 or 11 years, it's pretty much been him. Um, you know, both New Zealand test matches, win, series win in Australia, Grand Slams, um, you know, big performances against England. He, he's been there for nearly all of them. And, um, you know, to have that rock at full back and, and ability to beat that first line of, of defence in counter-attack as well. Maybe he now, you know, more recent years, hasn't been lauded the way he, sh mm -hmm. he should be. Um, he's you know, one of Ireland's great full-backs and one of Ireland's great players. And, you know, I think the most decorated, I think he tells the lads in, in <laughs> Leinster the whole time, he's the most decorated Irish rugby player of all time. But the reality is he is. And um, that's tough at, at 98 caps to, to yeah. be kind of what appears to be frozen out or, or to be not selected. And, and that can't have been easy to take, but God, he's, had, he's, he's produced many, many big days and, and many big performances, particularly when there were doubts around him. So you never know, he might get another opportunity over the course of the next six or seven weeks with, mm. with the need for experience or through injuries. So kind of hang in there and stay fit and, um, and stay positive if you do get that chance. Yeah, and we've seen that, I suppose, with the likes of Devon Toner and Jack McGrath coming back into the squad. But what interests me about Rob in particular is that as a specialist 15, they're so rare now. Like of the 16 backs that Andy Farrell picked, I think seven of them can play a fullback, but none of them are a dedicated fullback, maybe. Will Addison is probably the only one who plays there week in, week out. Mm. Is it going to be a case of maybe eating bread is soon forgotten and we'll only realise how important Rob Kearney was to Ireland, now he's not there. Yeah, and sometimes it is, you know, you're not fully, um, with, with some players, you, you know, something you're not full, fully appreciated until you're gone. And so, you know, what, what, um, what's missing? Um, you know, he, you know, his ability to dominate the air, I think any player will struggle to, mm -hmm. to be as impressive in that regard of his game. And when, when the game goes to a more kicking focus, um, that's you know where he came into his own, um, but defensively very very solid as well. Grass ability to cover grass in the in the backfield. I don't know too many other 15s who were capable of playing uh, the way he did. Uh, so um, yeah, I think there's a lot to be thankful for. We had you know great years and great memories with him. Um, you know he's 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 still in there. Um, the issue is as being a an out and out fullback is you're not a brilliant 23 um, yeah. man player. You know, it's either you're in the starting 15 or you tend to be on the periphery, a bit like as an out and out mm -hmm. 13. So, um, yeah, listen, he'll, he'll keep his fingers crossed that another opportunity will present itself because I'm sure he's got future Ireland aspirations still. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a hungry guy. One final question, um, this will be going out on our. Uh, House of Rugby podcast, um, which is, of course is Jerry Flannery and Andrew Trimble, two guys who you would have shared quite a lot of time with on the pitch. Uh, my question to you is, is that if you had to room with one of those two, or if you could, could choose which one, who would it be and why? Of Fla and... Fla and Trimby. 
Which both, one would you not want to? <laughs> both very different. Um, I think both would be, I'm, I'm probably expected to, to bag both of them, but I don't think I can. I think both good conversationalists, both mm. quirky. Trims has really come out of himself the first um, since retirement or even since he met Anna. I think that was a you know, revolutionary mm. experience in his life. Um, so, yeah, both give good value, both say it as it is, probably Flaz a bit more scathing or a bit more cutting, <laughs> but that's okay too. Honesty is the best policy. Um, so, it's a toss up. I, I think, can we get a three bed in there? <laughs> we might be able to sort something okay. out. Brian, thanks so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate nice it. One.